Thank you, first of all, for inviting me here. I'm, I'm very honored uh, to be here, as I'm actually uh, still a, a puppy career rise uh, compared to all the, the dog, the big dogs here. So, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm by training a theoretical uh, biologist, but then I uh, came into uh, ecology and uh, complex systems dynamics. And this started actually as a, as a small sidetrack, um, going into depression, mood disorders, mental disorders. And uh, now I'm still, still um, uh, interested in it. Anyway, I want to thank first some, uh, uh, some of my uh, collaborators. Um, which I uh, could really I couldn't have done this work uh, without them, and uh, especially I want to mention a few of the uh, psychologists and uh, psychiatrists um, which uh, with the, with which this uh, work is done, and uh, one of them is Marike Wicher. She uh, uh, collects temporal uh, data of uh, mood disorders and depressed and uh, non-depressed uh, persons. And uh, Angelique Kramer and uh, Danny Bors Borsboom, they both have um, uh, done a lot on uh, looking at uh, mental disorders as uh, networks and uh, dynamical systems. And Ken Kentler, who is a, a senior psy psychiatrist and who had a lot of uh, scientific contributions to the field, but um, here, uh, especially his uh, ph philosophical view on mental disorders was uh, very valuable. Um, well, and, and, and mainly these, these uh, two guys uh, um, below, Martin Scheffer and Egbert van Ness, who were my supervisors uh, during my PhD in Wageningen in the Netherlands. Um, and um, in, uh, yeah, especially Martin, uh, the inspiring um, work of Martin uh, on early warning signals um, uh, triggered uh, all of this, actually, and, and some of the um, work that have, has been presented here. Well, last but not least, uh, Johan Bolla, I'm now, uh, currently working at Indiana University uh, with him as a postdoc. And um, he teaches me a lot about um, well, big data analysis, but then big data in the sense of um, social media and uh, sentiment mood analysis. So I want to start actually with a, with a question that has been posed by, uh, by Ken Kentler um, in 2011. Um, what kind of things are psychiatric uh, disorders? It's, it's, it's maybe surprising that this it was a very recent uh, paper with, with this title. But if, if you look at it um, further on, it's actually not that, that surprising. Um, because it's, it's, it's a question that's still uh, being discussed at this moment. Because a lot of researchers are, are searching for the essential uh, characteristics of mental disorders like psychological, uh, neurological, or uh, genetic factors uh, that determine a mental disorder. But actually, no satisfi satisfying answers are, are found um, yet or until now. Um, well, I want you to, to meet Alex. Uh, this is Alex. He, he's laughing, but actually, he has a lot of uh, problems. He has some um, headaches, uh, forgetfulness, foggy eyesight. And uh, he comes to the doctor. And uh, she does a, a brain scan. And he, she diagnoses him with, with uh, unfortunately, with a brain tumor. Well, and she has certain treatment for him, um, uh, like surgery, uh, chemotherapy, that's uh, meant to um, treat the, the tumor, to make the tumor disappear. And obviously, she will also help him to, uh, to lower his, his symptoms. Um, well, this is the classical uh, medical uh, disease model. But now meet Jenny. Well, Jenny is also laughing, but she also has some, some problems. She has problems sleeping. Uh, she has uh, issues with depressed mood. And she has a lack of interest in, in, in actually everything. Well, her doctor tells her, um, does a, a, a symptom check using the, the DSM, and uh, tells her she's suffering from major depression. Well, the, uh, the treatment for Jenny is, uh, uh, is, is treatment and maybe um, antidepressants. But actually, these, uh, this treatment does not target major depression itself, because what is major depression itself? It actually targets uh, the problems, the symptoms. Well, major de this is maybe a bit low. But major depression is, is, is actually not an uh, empirically identifiable entity, uh, which can be treated directly, right? Um, 
So uh, an, an empirically identifiable entity can be, for example, Down syndrome or uh, cancer. And there's no actual lab test for major depression, like um, is, is there a third uh, chromosome or uh, does this person have a tumor? It's a very simplified way of, of showing things. But um, it is, it is uh, another way of thinking uh, for uh, mental disorders, uh, not as um, uh, a medical disease. So this, this is a bit of the traditional approach how to view a mental disorder, like major depression. So you suffer from major depression, and then you have a number of symptoms, well, like weight loss and sleeping problems, fatigue, concentration problems, suicidal thoughts. This kind of kind of thing. This is work by by Danny Borsboom and Angelique Kramer. What well, is they are actually proposing to move away from this traditional view, and they're not the first ones, but um, uh, they do give give uh, the theory a handle uh, because they uh, uh, suggest that we could uh, see actually um, things like a major depression and uh, gen general anxiety syndromes as a network of symptoms. And here, actually, the network is based uh, uh, simply on the, the DSM, the, um, and which symptoms uh, co-occur in uh, the DSM for the same uh, disease. And this uh, idea, uh, or, or that all these red dots are actually a major depression, and the, uh, the blue dots are a general anxiety syndrome, and the green ones are bridge symptoms, is not that surprisingly because that is based on uh, correlations. So these are, uh, uh, this is a very similar, almost the same network um, of uh, correlations based on a very large data set. And uh, this is actually how people uh, defined disorders uh, or mental disorders traditionally. It's just seeing like, oh, all these symptoms correlate very, very strongly. So they are part of the same uh, disorder. Right, so for example, um, uh, the major depression or the uh, general anxiety syndrome. And these two are very much uh, related to each other. That's why we see them in the same network here. Um, so, but the hypothesis here is that actually these symptoms correlate not uh, because they are uh, symptoms of one single cause, one single disease, but they actually correlate because they are causally, causally linked, right? So they form a network themselves that um, shapes the disease. So there is no causal um, uh, disease. So that's an, an alternative view, which is intuitively very uh, logical, I would say. Well, especially for, for de depression, you can imagine you have, have sleep problems, which gives you concentration problems, which makes you irritable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, this network view allows us uh, to define individual uh, differences in terms of con uh, connection strengths. So, and also individual paths uh, to disorders. So you can imagine that, that Bob here on the left side, um, he has sleeping problems. And uh, the sleeping problems actually uh, trigger uh, fatigue. And uh, for him, it, it makes him feeling on the edge. Well, and uh, Alice actually uh, follows a different path, but also ends up with a, a general anxiety syndrome. Um, and starting with sleeping problems, actually, she, her lack of sleep uh, uh, results in, 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 in concentration problems. So there, her link is very strong between sleep and concentration, which makes her feel, feel uh, irritable and uh, leads to anxiety. Well, this, um, uh, this kind of path um, so can, can differ very much uh, between individuals. And you can also imagine that, that the network actually works on different levels. So you actually don't have, you're an individual, but you're interacting with, with other individuals. So if your kid has sleeping problems, it's quite likely that you have uh, sleeping problems, right? And you get irritable, which makes your kid irritable, etc. So these um, uh, causal links uh, go beyond even uh, the individual networks. And obviously, uh, you can imagine that all these, uh, these links are, are affected by th genetic factors. So there's, there's one of the, the causes, uh, hormones, live events, uh, but also culture, when you can think of, uh, uh, of many more things. So one person is likely to be very resilient um, to uh, falling into to perturbations that, that make you fall into depression, and the other one is not. 
So what kind of things are psychiatric disorders? Well, in, his, in this essay in 2011, uh, Ken Kendler essentially proposes to, to view mental disorders as attractors in a large, complex, uh, dynamical system. Uh, he doesn't use this, this exact wording, but it's, uh, it's, it's essentially uh, the same idea. So what we thought is, is um, uh, could depression actually be an alternative um, state of um, uh, an alternative of a healthy state, right? So a depressed state and a healthy state as, a, as a alternative stable states. And that would be depicted in the last graph. Um, so you can imagine that some people, um, uh, if there's a slow driver, like, like uh, uh, people experience work stress, increasing work stress, um, they, slide, they, they gradually slide into uh, a depression. And other people will show a more of a, a threshold response. And even other people, and that's what, what uh, we are thinking of, um, actually show a very um, abrupt shift. Well, we've seen this, this graph now for, for uh, a couple of times, uh, which is uh, uh, essentially full bifurcation. And um, which makes them vulnerable if they're, they're around here, they're close to the, uh, to the bifurcation point, to small perturbation, let's say an upsetting phone call, um, which triggers a collapse uh, to a depressed state. And actually from the depressed state, it will be very hard to uh, get back to the original state. So the stress level has to be decreased so much until a, a certain point that you can, um, that you can flip back. Well, intuitively, um, I think this, this idea makes a lot of sense, right? People, you see it around, your, if, you, if you know somebody that has suffered from a depression or is suffering from a depression, they seem to be, be trapped. And indeed, there seem to be uh, strong positive feedbacks that uh, trigger such a collapse. You can think of, of uh, a person that has a depressed mood and um, uh, he actually gets socially isolated because he doesn't go out anymore. And this social isolation makes him, makes him feel worthless, um, which actually uh, increases this, his depressed mood again. And the same idea of uh, a depressed mood increases uh, worrying and all this worrying actually makes you even more stressed and depressed. So these positive feedbacks are intuitively uh, quite reasonable. And they can lead to, uh, they, uh, so our assumption is that they would lead uh, to a depression. Well, there, there, um, uh, this was an intuitive uh, idea, but uh, um, uh, quite recently, uh, Laura Bringman showed that there are indeed indications of positive feedbacks. So here we see three positive um, emotions, uh, relaxed, cheerful, and pleasant event. And here we see three negative emotions, sad, fearful, and worry. And, um, uh, they um, looked at causal links. They call it causal. They're, they're actually partial uh, correlations. So we have to be careful here. <laughs> um, but uh, what they see, and it's, it's quite strikingly, I think, is that positive emotions uh, indeed uh, trigger positive emotions. Um, and negative emotions trigger negative emotions. And is, am I still peeping? No. And the negative emotions actually uh, have a negative effect on positive emotions and vice versa. So there are quite strong indications of these uh, positive feedbacks. Um, so if, if the system is indeed um, experience, uh, experiencing a real tipping point, we might be able to, uh, to find early warning signals of the tipping point towards depression. Um, so what we did um, uh, in this paper um, is ma we ma first made a very simple model actually to illustrate what's happening um, uh, or what you would expect, what kind of signals you would expect. Right, so we have actually four emotions, anxious, sad, uh, cheerful and content. It's, it's, it's simply based on a, on a Lotka Volterra uh, competition model where uh, the positive emotions and the negative emotions facilitate each other and uh, they compete uh, with the rest. Um, and you can imagine this is actually more, a much more complex network um, underlying um, but that these are uh, it is a physical network that we can call latent, uh, latent variables, um, which we cannot measure, but we do measure uh, these emotions. 
And actually, the, so if, if we would simulate such a large network, it, it, you would come to the same uh, conclusions. Um, so this has been introduced actually very well by, by Jeff Gore and by Professor Chen already, um, but I will just revisit it for, for just a moment. Um, what, would you, uh, what you would expect far from a transition and uh, close to a transition if you would have uh, time series data of these uh, emotions, so if you would have uh, uh, emotions over time. Um, well, close to a transition you would expect uh, critical slowing down. So the system, if you perturb it, it will take much longer uh, to get back to its uh, equilibrium state um, uh, than if you're in uh, far from a transition. And that leads to increased variance uh, for both the positive and the negative emotions. Um, it would lead to increased uh, temporal autocorrelation for the uh, individual emotions. And also, um, and this is, uh, these are both uh, based on, on, on um, uh, the mathematical concept that you have um, the, eigenvalue, the dominant eigenvalue goes to, goes to zero. And because this dominant eigenvalue, one of the dominant eigenvalues goes, or one of the eigenvalue values goes to zero, I'm sorry, um, because of that, um, your system actually becomes uh, lower dimensional. And this is what uh, Professor Chen uh, talked about um, as well. So you, what you would expect is that uh, cross correlations between emotions will also uh, become stronger. So here you see uh, within valence emotions, uh, within valence cross correlation, and between valence uh, cross correlation. And obviously within valence, which means um, uh, positive emotions, with, uh, positive emo the cross correlation between a positive emotion and another positive emotion, um, that is a positive uh, correlation, and uh, a negative and uh, a positive emotion would be uh, a negative cross correlation. But they're much stronger uh, close to the tipping point than. Uh, uh, far from the tipping point. Well, that's you, what you would expect from theory. Well, that's uh, <coughs> something we know already, but now um, we, we actually have temporal data. And uh, this is quite, quite new in this, in this field. Um, it's called the experience sampling method. And um, uh, what, what we did, or actually we, we took this uh, existing data already, uh, but what they did is followed a, a general population of people and a depressed population. And they gave them for uh, six consecutive days a watch and it would beep every um, semi-random 90 minutes. So not exactly, but, but almost. Um, and at, at that time, they had to, to drop everything that they were doing and they had to fill in a self-assessment form. This would make you depressed already. <laughs> <laughs> But okay, it's a way, right? It's something, yeah. It's, it's something uh, at least to, uh, a way that we can g get temporal data. And this is always the problem working with people but you can't, because you cannot push them towards depression as a nice experiment, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so what they had to fill in is, is uh, um, uh, different, uh, different things, but uh, one of the things was uh, their current emotional state uh, on content, satisfied, anxious, and uh, sad, on a scale from one to seven. And then we also monitored their follow-up course of uh, their depressive symptoms. Uh, a year later, uh, depending a bit on the group, uh, one of the groups was a year later, and the other group was an average of the next um, uh, four month periods. Um, so um, the results are actually quite striking uh, because the general when the general uh, population would be closer to a depression, we see higher autocorrelations and uh, variants of negative emotions, and uh, uh, also vice versa. So for the depressed population, if the depressed population would get closer to recovery, we also see higher autocorrelation variants in this case uh, in the positive emotions. So that's what you see here. Um, on the left side, we see the, general, the negative emotions in the general population. These are the positive emotions in the depressed population. In the upper graph, we see uh, temporal autocorrelations. And in the lower graph, we see uh, uh, variants. And uh, the three points you see every time are uh, the third types of chains in a follow-up course of depression. So, um, and you see a very striking uh, pattern here, right? Um, 
And then the second thing is, so what we would also expect is, is, is uh, increased correlations, right? And that's also what we see here. We see higher correlation between uh, emotions for the general population and a higher correlation uh, for the depressed population. So uh, a similar graph, um, uh, these are the within valence correlations um, up here, and these are the uh, between valence uh, correlations. And they all um, nicely uh, go up. Um, well, this, this uh, idea of, of, of autocorrelation actually is strengthened by, uh, uh, by previous work, uh, but it was called just differently, um, which was uh, the phenomenon of uh, emotional inertia. So there was not a real good explanation for it, but actually, so emotional inertia is, uh, refers to the degree to which a person's current emotional state is predicted by the prior emotional state, reflecting how much it carries over from one moment to the next. Well, this is temporal autocorrelation. Um, and this uh, increased emotional inertia was actually predictive of the onset of depressive disorder. So it's a nice um, uh, link, actually. Um, the only problem with the analysis we did is that actually we don't see any transitions, right? We just uh, have, have followed these uh, people for a short period of time, and then we look later on, uh, are you depressed or not? And um, uh, we draw some uh, conclusions from that. Well, the nice thing is that we now have a very um, a nice study, which, which uh, has not been published yet, um, by Marike Wiggers, um, where we followed one individual. He was uh, voluntarily <laughs> doing this self-assessment, so this ESM, uh, for uh, a couple of weeks. And during that period, he was actually suffering from depression already for, uh, um, uh, he had, had many depressive uh, episodes and he was on antidepressants for a long time. And during this period, he uh, wanted to quit his antidepressants and see uh, what happened. So um, what we see here is that um, uh, in the period of, of quitting, he actually uh, was quite okay. So after here, uh, he was not on antidepressants anymore. And his depressive symptoms were, were pretty low. But then uh, he had a big switch, and he fell, fell into uh, depression. And this was also really a clinical uh, uh, depression. And actually, here, somewhere here, he started uh, uh, antidepressants again, because this was not, he couldn't uh, keep this up, which makes sense. Um, but now, uh, what we see is if we use a moving window and, and, and look for, uh, for autocorrelation and variance differences, we see that really both go, go nicely up uh, until uh, the shift. <clears throat> and the same again for, uh, for correlations in the network. So we see that the correlations, this is the first phase, is later on, later on, and this is the last, um, increase, so the positive correlations. Um, um, uh, get stronger and also the negative uh, correlations get stronger. So, um, uh, to come to the conclusion of these uh, de uh, depression experiments, well, increased autocorrelation, variance, and correlation uh, between emotions are indeed indicative for proximity of transition towards depression and towards healthy state. And I would say that the indication of uh, that there are positive feedbacks indeed. Um, that there is, uh, uh, the new data suggests that there are indeed abrupt shifts and uh, that there are early warning signals. So together this is to suggest that depression and the healthy state um, are alternative stable states. We're not sure, but um, um, it, it's a strong case, I would say. And that the transitions between them are critical transitions or, uh, or so-called tipping points. So our results strengthen this uh, network view that I presented in the beginning of mental disorders. And uh, the nice thing, and, and Jeff also uh, talked about this, um, is that actually we can, we, we can circumvent this, this um, full understanding, so the, the, the network I've showed you uh, before of, the, of all the latent variables. Um, but still, with these with this kind of tools, uh, we might be able to improve ability to anticipate clinically uh, uh, relevant mood shifts. Um, but of course, there, there are many things to be done, and um, one of the things is uh, uh, what do the many roads uh, look like, uh, the many roads to uh, developmental disorders. Uh, also, what sort of genetic, biological, uh, psychological, and environmental factors govern uh, these individual differences in the strengths of, uh, of connections between symptoms. 
And, um, and now we just have, have actually uh, uh, an NA equals one case, at least for the individual uh, level experiments. So it would be, would be good to replicate that. And um, for sure, uh, it, it would be very interesting to see this convergence cross mapping presented by, by George Sugihara um, uh, and to find the, the, the real causal links uh, between sy symptoms. And with this ESM temporal data, we actually might be, be able to do this. And actually, Angelique uh, Kramer has been uh, uh, working on that already. So um, one, of, one of the things I wanted to, to uh, conclude with um, is it, how can this theory, because it's still theory and, and, and concepts, and, um, ca can help in targeting and evaluating therapeutic uh, interventions. Um, well, you might think of, of, of people that have um, uh, an app on their phone uh, in which uh, they can track their mood instead of this uh, old-fashioned uh, watch and, and, and forms that they have to fill in. And actually, these kind of devices already, these kind of apps exist because people really want to, to see how they're actually changing and developing over time. And especially, uh, for example, people with, uh, that are suffering from um, uh, bipolar disorder because they know they have these this cycles and they, they, they want to, to see their own development over time. So it might be, it might be a, a way to, to, um, um, to track these, uh, to the data of these apps um, and that you get a warning, right, from your phone. <laughs> Autocorrelation is going up. <laughs> I don't know. It's future thoughts. Well, then you, um, there in the, at the University of Connecticut, they're actually um, making a symptom detection app um, by not only tracking mood, like what we, uh, we've been doing, but also things like activity, energy level based on, on, on your voice, your tone, your pulses, and your social interactions. <laughs> So this might also be a way to, uh, to track much more uh, over time. And I'm excited now, I'm, uh, since I'm currently working at Indiana University, um, to, to track mood in social media and see if we, if we can find any signals there. Uh, so for example, what we're looking at is, is people that tweet, and people actually do this. Sorry, I'll be, I'll be quick. People actually do this, uh, like uh, I was diagnosed bipolar or I was diagnosed depression today. And um, we want to um, analyze their sentiment over, uh, over time. Well, there's a lot of issues with that. Um, but I think what, what's just nice to show very quickly is that, uh, that there, there seem to be very strong transitions. This is a person that uh, was diagnosed bipolar, or at least he states that he was diagnosed bipolar. And he has very strong transitions in his uh, tweet frequency. Um, so I'll skip this. Uh, skip the rest. Well, and I'm also very interested in social early warning signals, so looking into Twitter and see if we can, can um, predict any, any uh, uh, riots and those kind of things by uh, looking into early warning signals. Well, with this, I want to thank you very much for listening. It would seem that, uh, you know, looking at the hysteresis curve, that not only will popping down, but also popping back up is more of a, I was wondering if bipolar disorder would be something better to look at in terms of seeing this in both directions. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, um, I, I think bipolar is very, a very interesting case to look at. We don't have the data uh, at this moment, but uh, you, you can, can imagine that actually bipolar disease is, is some slow, fast cycle, right? Where you, where you go over the, uh, the stable state and you're actually exhausting yourself. You fall into a depression, you go back. So you, will, you would expect early warning signals for all these, these uh, transitions in the cycles. So yeah, for sure.